we've been in the book of James. We've been studying the book of James. So if you turn your Bibles open to James, we're going to close the book out tonight. And James says some interesting things. He closes his book kind of in an interesting way. He opens his book to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. His ministry was to the Jews. He's the half-brother of Christ. And um, he closes his book. It's an unusual closing of a book. I suppose not for James, but he's been an unusual writer anyhow. But here's what he writes in verse 19 and 20, and I'm going to pull an idea out of it and talk about it tonight. He says, my brethren, that's how he opened his book. And he, and he tells you who his brethren are, the 12, 12 tribes of Israel dispersed abroad because of persecution and discipline. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know, the one who turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sin. When we come back, I want to talk about, well, who is a sinner? And who is a sinner? Well, it's obviously, uh, for a lot of people, it is the one who commits a multitude of sin. <laughs> At least that's what, <laughs> and I guess we could all put our hand in the air, couldn't we? Multitude of sin. It, the, the secret is, is how do we get rid of that so it doesn't bury us? And we'll talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about the sinner, the multitude of sin, and how we get how we get out from under it. Like a, it's like a avalanche. You get a little on you. If you don't get it off from you, the whole lot gets on you. The first thing you know, you can't get out from under it. And so we're going to talk about that tonight out of this passage of Scripture. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to get in our study. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. As an unbeliever, you will not understand it spiritually. You will understand it in the natural mind, but you won't understand it in the spiritual realm. And so you don't read the Bible very much because it don't make a lot of sense to you. Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians 2.14. But once you get born again through believing the gospel of Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up resonance in your soul, in your body, and he illuminates the word of God in your soul, and all of a sudden you start reading the Bible and it starts making sense to you. And that's quite a, revel quite a revelation to a person. And... Uh, So the point is that if you are a believer, then you need to be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And he, he's able to teach you. John 14, 26 says he teaches and recalls what he teaches. And I love that because sometimes I can't think, well, what is it? What is it? Uh, I, I, I know it. Uh, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. And he goes like, if it's on the tip of the tongue, I can get it out. <laughs> that's recall. I can teach you and recall. And so that's, that's a marvelous idea. And so... What is evidence of carnality? Carnality is personal sin. How do you deal with personal sin? First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess it. Homologeo is a Greek word that means to name, cite, or come into agreement with God. That that's sin. And what do you do with it? He says you confess it because the blood of Christ took care of all sin, past, present, and future. When you confess your sin as a believer, when you confess your sin, the Bible says, here's your promise. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sin, that word if is a third class condition. It's volitional. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you do, here's what he promises to do for you. He says, I will forgive you and I will cleanse you from all your sin and unrighteousness. Think about that. Why wouldn't you confess your sin when he promises you that he will forgive you and cleanse you from it as a believer in Christ? So that's 1 John 1, 9. I would encourage you to think about that. I'd encourage you to do that before you start Bible study. If you are a believer, by that I mean you believe that Jesus died for your sins. 
was buried, and on the third day raised from the dead. It's not just that Jesus died for your sins, because three guys died for sin that day. Right? It's the guy that got raised on the third day became the savior of mankind. And it wasn't just that he died. He died and was raised from the dead on the third day. And if you believe that, you get saved. And if you don't believe it, then you stay, you remain unsaved, which is not a good place to be, especially if you die. So let's, let's bow our heads and shut our eyes and take a moment to reflect Christ came into the world to save sinners. How does he save them? They acknowledge they're a sinner to him. Huh? I'm a sinner. How do you know it? Because they sin. What do I do? Believe that Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. When I believe it, I'm saved. When I'm saved, the Bible becomes a kind of an important book. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us. And tonight we talk about who is a sinner and how does that status change in his life. It's very important. It's very important to all of us. And so I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one, of the, one of the problems you have when you look at James 5, 19 and 20, one of the problems you have is James talking to believers About believers, it was James talking to believers about unbelievers. I mean, is, is James saying, my brethren, if any one of you stray from the truth and one turns him back, let him know, let the one who's turning people back, let him know that he who turns sinners from the air of his way saves souls and covers a multitude of sin. Is he saying in this passage to believers you need to be ambassadors for Christ and you need to share the gospel of Christ with other people because through the gospel, people's souls are saved and multitude of sins are dealt with properly. Or, or is James referring to sinners here in a pharisaical way? Is he talking about believers who are considered still to be sinners. So, there is controversy over these passages of what James is talking about. So, rather than try to figure out what James is talking about, because I've studied the whole book and I don't know what he means by that at the end of the book. You understand that? Because it's controversial. I'd rather take you today and tell you what Jesus says. How about that? So we don't... We don't have to sweat about this passage of scriptures. I personally have a view of what James is saying here about saving a soul. And when you save a soul, you cover a multitude of sins. And that's the way I view this passage. But I'm telling you, not all people view it that way. So I'm telling you, but so why not just go to the man himself? What did Jesus say about it? Okay, so I'm. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to show you what Jesus says about the sinner. What did he say? So in my first passage, I want you to go with me to Luke. We'll see what Jesus says because that would be sufficient for me. Uh, let's see what the man said himself in Luke 5. In Luke 5, and I, I've got this on your paper, but in Luke 5, this subject comes up. In, in Luke 5, 27 through 32. And this occurs, the man that is talked about here is Levi in verse 27, 5, 27. And after he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi. Now, let me tell you who Levi is in real, in real lifetime in the New Testament. He's Matthew. A dis that became a disciple of Christ. Matthew, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is Matthew. How do you know that, Ron? Because it doesn't say it. Because it's mentioned, this same story is mentioned in Matthew 9, 9 through 13. And he's called Matthew. It's the same story. He was, 
called Levi, and this is and this is when Jesus called Matthew to become his disciple. This is just Luke's account. And after he had went out, he noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax office. He was collecting taxes for Rome from Jewish people. That's why the Jews didn't like him. <laughs> they didn't like him at all. And Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. You remember that's a kind of a, a typical saying that Jesus did with all the disciples. He said it with all the disciples. You know, he'd come along and say, come follow me. And they would leave their nets and follow him or their business. They just left their business and followed him. And that's the calling of Matthew. But I want you to see the bigger story in his calling because Luke goes into much more detail. And he, Matthew or Levi, left everything behind and rose and began to follow him. Levi, he's, he's wealthy. Levi wealthy. The tax collectors were wealthy. Rome paid him well. And he left everything behind. And Levi, verse 29, watches, gave a big party. Levi threw a big party. Apparently, everybody knew that this guy threw good parties because everybody's going to show up. Everybody's going to show up. Levi's showing a party. That word went through the street. Everybody went to his party. Levi gave a big reception uh, for him, for Jesus, in his house, gave a big party for him. And great crowds of tax gatherers and other people who were reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? I want you to show you something now. See in verse 29. Tax collectors and what? Other people. The tax collectors came and a whole lot of other people. Now they're of all different kinds. The, the firemen, the policemen, you know, the plumbers, the electrician, all the guys who like to go to good parties, they were there. They're called other people, right? All different, we do all different walks of life business-wise. But watch how the Pharisees describe them. Watch, look at their prejudice about it. Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? Look how they described everybody else. Everybody there, the electricians, the plumbers, mama pop shop down the street, whatever it was, all the other people that knew Levi through great parties went. But because he was a tax collector and in the Pharisee's mind, a sinner, everybody who went to the party was what was called other people in, in attendance other than just the close friends of the ta tax collecting buddies. They called sinners. <laughs> they called them sinners. Now, they called them, you know, they would have never called themselves that. They called everybody else that. Now, in verse 31, Jesus gives them a common sense. Because verse 30 is prejudice at the core. Would you call that prejudice? Of course it is. It's prejudice at the core, man. In verse 31, Jesus answered and said to them, here's a common sense. He uses common sense to go like, what are you guys talking about? Common sense. Listen to what he says. It is not those who are well who need a physician, a doctor, but those who are sick. I mean, nobody goes to the doctor when they're feeling well, right? Unless he's a hypochondriac. Right? The physician's job or calling in life is to help the sick. So it's a common sense principle. He says, he says to him, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. This party was thrown for Jesus, but everybody came because they knew Levi through a good party. Now, verse 33. They said to him, in other words, the Pharisees, they said to him, the disciples of John, John the Baptist, 
often fast and often offered prayers, and the disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but your disciples, they eat and drink. Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendants of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them. And then he goes on to another dissertation with them. I want to stop up there at verse 32 before we get into another, uh, uh, another conflict with these people, right? I just want to show you something. Now watch. On your paper, I put you down some ideas that we ought to pull out of this about what Jesus is thinking. He goes to a party, a party thrown from him, Levi. Levi's going to join his team. He's going to, he's going to leave his business, right? He says he left his business. And so he's spending, he's throwing the last big padu, and he's, he's going to become a disciple of Christ. And so he takes, and I, I want to show you, I put down that word tax collector. I put down the Greek word for tax collector in your other translations is probably called a publican. Publican, not Republican now, public, just publican. Right? Publicans. Because that's what that word means. The tax collector or publican. You'll you'll hear these words interchanged in the English language. Who actually came besides the tax collectors, friends of Levi, business associates, were a whole bunch of other people from other walks of life who the Pharisees, out of their prejudice, because they're at this party place with Levi, the tax collector, he, he considers them that way and lumps everybody in that same category. Did they not? Of course they did. That's prejudice. That's spiritual prejudice. Then he gives them a principle of common sense about a doctor. Nobody goes to a doctor when they're well. They go to a doctor when they're sick. I haven't come for the righteous. I've come for the sinner. Jesus Christ didn't come to this world for the righteous people. He came for the sinner. So here's the point. <laughs> Until you know you're a sinner, you have no reason to be saved. When I was a sinner and didn't know I was a sinner, I certainly had no reason to be saved. It wasn't only until I realized I was a sinner that I realized I had a need to be saved. Now think about that. So how does a person come to realize he's a sinner? See, that's really interesting. How does it, how does it happen? Well, at this party, a whole bunch of people, I'll tell you, one person already realized it was Matthew. Matthew already realized it, was saved, and was leaving his successful business to become a preacher, a street preacher. He left his whole business. He was a wealthy man and left his whole business to be a street preacher because that's what Jesus was. You do know that. He's a street preacher. Now, Jesus states why his why he came to the world, why he came to the earth. He states why he came to into the world. Listen to what he said. He states his purpose in coming into the world. He said, I have not come. No, notice that's a negative. I'm going to tell you what I didn't come for, and I'm going to tell you what I did come for. Listen to what he said he didn't come for. I didn't come for the righteous. I didn't come for the person that doesn't, doesn't have a need to be saved because he's saved. I didn't come for the person who's not righteous, but it's not interesting in getting saved because he don't know he's a sinner. He said, I'll tell you who I came for. I came for the person, man, woman, child, who comes to realize they are a sinner. That's who I came for. I want to hold your place there for a moment. No. I, I, I wrote it on the back. Look on the back sheet of your paper. At the very bottom, I've got one, two, three, four. I got four, four statements in bold print. Do you see that? I want you to go. I want you to go to the third one, 
right now. I want you to go to the third one right now and listen to what Paul wrote. Paul, the apostle Paul. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners among whom I'm foremost of all. King James calls him the chief. He said he said he was the chief sinner. Probably a lot of us would question that. And so, <laughs> well, I don't know. What did you do? And then I'll compare it. I'll tell you what I did, and we'll see. who. Did. The point is that he felt not only when he came to know, compare. Now, how do you compare yourself to what? You compare yourself to Christ. Christ says, look, I came. Well, why could you come into the world to save me? Because I was not a sinner. I was born outside the slave market of sin. I was born outside of where everybody else is born. Now, listen to me. This is important. Every human being is born in that circle, and there's another circle over here. Everybody is born in Adam. Here's Adam's circle. Everybody is born in that. When he's born in Adam, Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, by one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death spread upon all men, for all have sinned. Then Romans 3.25, all have fallen short of the glory of God. The glory of God is Christ. On that back part of your paper, look at this. The second one in bold print down, second one in bold print, watch this. But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, everybody's born in Adam, and Adam, you're born a sinner. You're born a sinner. A sinner sins. <laughs> he, he's, he's not a nerd. He's a sinner. A sinner sins. That's what he does. That's why he's called that. Everybody, everybody is born there in Adam. Everybody. Look, watch this now. Go back to that back page and look at the very first one. Bold print. Look at the very first one. For through one man, Adam, through one man, Adam's disobedience, many were made what? Huh? What were they made? They were made sinners. Listen, and what's the one man? Adam. You're born physically into this world as a sinner. Of course you sin. That's what sinners do. Listen to me. At birth in Adam, Adam's sin... That's, that's Genesis 2.17. Don't eat of the tree. The day you eat, die, and you will die. At, you were made a sinner. That's the imputation of Adam's sin. The imputation of Adam's sin. You were made a sinner. I didn't make it up. Look at that again. Through one man's disobedience, he's talking about Adam. Many were made sinners. You were made a sinner. That's an, that, listen, and this word made in the Greek language means appointed to a position. It means you were put in a, you were appointed into a position, and that position now has status. There are 13 judicial charges in Adam's sin that every sinner, every person is under. Every person is born this way. The reason you're a human being is that you were born in Adam, who was the father of the humanity of man. Well, look. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. What does this passage here say? Listen to this. All are made sinners, even so through the obedience of one Christ, many will be made righteous. The impu imputation of of God's righteousness in Christ, here is in Christ, how do I get from here to here? See, that's the question. How do I get from being a sinner to becoming a saint? Because every person in Christ 
is positionally a saint. Not because he lives that way, but because he got saved that way. How do I get from this circle to this circle? Jesus Christ dies on the cross to take care of this one. He's buried and raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. That is the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Romans 1, 16, when you believe it, the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. You don't save yourself. You don't turn from this. You can't get out of that. You're under, you can't get out. Nicodemus couldn't get out of it, and he was a righteous, he was a do-gooder, righteous guy full of religion. Nicodemus, John the third chapter, John 3.16 was given to that man. Paul was a, a top-notch a top -notch Jewish theologian who was not saved. He just told you that. How do I get from there to there? Colossians 1.13. There's two. I want you to turn it at. Turn to, turn to that and see it. I'll show it to you. Here's Colossians. And here's how it works. It's not brain surgery, but it is regeneration. It is redemption. Here's 113. It says that the gospel, Christ on the cross, burial and raised, it says in, in Colossians 113, either the word rescue or delivered, for he delivered us or rescued us from the domain of darkness. That's here. This is called darkness. This is the domain of darkness, one of the 13 judicial charges on every human being. You're spiritually dead, you're spiritually blind, you're spiritually dead, yada, yada, yada. All right? Now watch this. He delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers. Watch. We are rescued from here. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are delivered from Adam, uh, in Adam, listen, now watch, and transferred into Christ. <coughs> Colossians 1.13, he, Jesus Christ, delivers us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom, the kingdom of his beloved son. You know what that's called? That's called grace. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, self-works. Least any man should boast. When you get saved, all the boasting goes to the one who died on the cross, was buried, and raised the dead. They did to deliver you and to transfer you, and that's grace. And you're not saved any other way, dear heart. You are not saved any other way, and you ought to be thankful for that. You ought to be thankful for that. So, Jesus said, I'm going to tell you what he said again. He said, I have come into the world to save sinners. That's how I've come. Now, I want to show you another passage. If you would go with me to Luke. Let's go to Luke, the seventh chapter. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You have no idea why you're here tonight. You have no idea. You think it's an honor of Claudia, and I'll take that. But you know the truth of the matter is, you're here because Claudia prayed you in tonight. You're here because she prayed you in. I had no idea you were going to be here, and I didn't build a sermon thinking you were coming. I don't do that. But here we are. We are where the rubber hits the pavement, aren't we? Here we are. <laughs> uh, here we are. 
Now what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with it? And I've sat where you sat. I've sat where you sat. And had come to the grips that I was a sinner. And I couldn't get out of it. Now some of you aren't sick enough of it to walk away from it. And some of you are. I became like the prodigal son. I got stuck in a pig pen of life. It was sucking the life right out of me. And I was sick of it. I was sick of it. And I came to my senses. And I said, if there's a way out of this, I need it. And the way out for me and the way out for Paul and the way out for every other human being that's ever come this way is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you think there's another way, there isn't. And if you die without Christ, you have no hope. If you die without Christ, you have no hope. You have no hope. And if you think there's nothing beyond this life, You've made the biggest foolish mistake of your mind you could ever make because there's certainly life after death. I mean, where did life come from if it's not going somewhere? And none of us smart enough to answer that. So, here we are in Luke, the seventh chapter. I'm not going to run you through all this all the way, but in Luke, the third chapter, because we're in Luke. He deals with a parable of two debtors. Now, in your own spare time, I'd like you, if you would, sometime between now and death or something, read 7th chapter 28 through 35 because there's a preview to this coming chapter. There's a preview. And there's another party. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I love parties. So, we got another Pharisee and a lawyer. His name is Simon. We're in the seventh chapter, verse 30. Well, let's pick up 29. And when all the people and the tax collectors, there they go again. You probably would have liked these tax collectors, even though they took your money. They threw some more kind of party. The Pharisees and the lawyers, uh, 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 tax gatherer, heard this. For they, they heard this. They acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. That's the preview that you need to previously study. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. And then he goes into a discussion with them about this. He goes into a discussion, which I want to skip all that. I want to get down to the, the, the good part where I want to get tonight. A lady comes in in this party. A lady comes in in verse 31. Uh, and she anoints. She, she, she comes in and, and anoints him with oil. Verse 36. One of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. <laughs> And, and who would have called her that? No matter what she did. She could have been a beautician. She could have been a lawyer. But who would have called her a sinner? <laughs> yeah. They sure would have. Yep. And when she learned that he was reclining that, and listen, they would have called her a sinner, be, be, not because she, she was an Adam, but because of her behavior that they disapproved of. <laughs> Their prejudice against her. I mean, it didn't matter what she did. She could have been a lawyer. 
She brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she, she, kept, she kept wiping uh, 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 and began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with a the perfume. When the ph Pharisees who had invited him saw this, the Pharisee said to himself, if this man were, were, were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who's touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus answered, <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. He said, a certain money, watch the parable. A cer certain money lender had two debtors. One owned 500 denarius and the other 50. When they were unable to pay, repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them, therefore, will love him more? Simon answered, well, I suppose the one whom he forg forgave the most. And he said to him, you've judged correctly. And turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, which was common courtesy of the day. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. That was common courtesy. You did that to anybody who entered your house, no matter who it was. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, which was common courtesy, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Simon, for this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he turned to the woman and said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those reclining at the table began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sin? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now here's what you're going to miss. There were two debtors. They were both sinners. How do I know? Because they're both debtors. <laughs> Agreed? They were both debtors. One didn't think so because he was religious and a good person. He thought no God would throw nobody. I'm a good person. I don't do any bad. Doesn't matter. They were both sinners. The religious guy who thought she was, but he wasn't. They were both. And that day, they both had a chance. Listen, when Christ died on the cross, he died for both of them. He died for both of them. He died for both of them. But only one of them accepted it. He paid both of their debts, but only one accepted it. When you don't accept it, then you have to pay it yourself. That's where the rubber hits pavement. Do you think you're going to get out of this life without it? You can. You can get out of this life without ever, ever believing this story, without ever believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you can't get out of the next life. Now you're going to get out of the next one. It's appointed unto men who wants to die in the judgment. You're not going to get out of the next one. So why wouldn't you get saved? What do you think you have to do to be saved? What do you think you have to do? What do you think you have to change in order to be saved? Listen to me. Listen to me closely. Nothing. Not one thing. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. Not one 
thing. Don't let the devil lie to you. Not one thing. Christ has paid it all so that you can have it all by grace. In our story, only one went home justified by God's grace. Did you know that? It wasn't the Pharisee called Simon. It was the woman everybody called the sinner. She went home justified. One debtor went home. One debtor went home justified with their sins paid for. Agreed? You know who that one was? The one who acknowledged she was a sinner in need of salvation and found it in a person called Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about salvation, man. That's what I'm talking about. Now look. I got more and you can't take it. So look. In no sense me. Beat beating a dead horse. But if you read the rest of it, you will see that Jesus Christ came into this world for you and me. You'll never get saved until you understand you're a sinner in need of salvation. You're a sinner. Not because you sin. Not because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. You're not a sinner because you sin. And that's just one, th one of 13 judicial charges against you. Not because you've done anything, because you've been born to an Adam. How do I know it? Because you're human. Are, are you human? I mean, dog, cat, pony. Oh, you're human. You've been made in the image according to the likeness of God. You need to be born again. You need to be born again. You will hear this message again. If it, rub, if it rubs you raw now, you're going to hear this again in eternity at the judgment seat. Great white throat judgment. You're going to hear this sermon again, and you're not going to have the opportunity to believe it. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do it tonight. That's up to you when you want to do it. You got to do it. I had a good friend of mine that did it after a serious automobile accident and survived it. And he couldn't sleep unless he got a good hot bath. And so he got up one night about 3 o'clock in the morning, got a, good hot sleep, got, got a good hot bath, and laying in the tub, realized he was a sinner in need of salvation. It was just as simple as him understanding that Christ, has wor his blood washed away his sin like the water washed away his dirt, made him feel better. And right there in the bathtub, he said, I want to believe. I believe that Christ died for my sins and buried for I want to be saved. He got up and he called me. Pastor does not like to hear a call at 4 o'clock in the morning. They're never good. And everybody was hollering and hooting on the other end of the line. And I said, what's going on? He said, his, his name was Wormy. That was a nickname because he was a pipeline guy. He said, it's wormy. I said, and he was known to party. He was known to party. And I said to him, why are you calling me at 4 o'clock in the morning, my buddy? And he said, because I just got saved. I said, well, how in the world did you get saved? And he told me about being in the bathtub. That's the first bathtub conversion I ever heard of. <laughs> but I thank God for it. Now, my people have heard this story before. I called my deacons because we had him on our prayer list. I called my deacons at 4.30 in the morning. Deacons don't like to have their pastor call them at 4.30 in the morning, I can tell you that. And I told them that Wormy got saved. And they said, well, I'm going over to see. But nobody could believe it. Well, they, and so... 
I said, yeah, I am too. I'm going over. And so we all went over. It's like 5 o'clock. His, his wife, Nancy, be, began putting eggs on the stove. Because people, we were farm people, and people were going to work. And I'm telling you, we celebrated. That house rocked until about 8, 8.30. I mean, everybody in the community came by. Everybody stopped on the way to work. Got some eggs and bacon and, and could not believe it. Marlon, that was his true name. Old Wormy got saved. Sure got saved, didn't he, baby? I mean, he sure got saved. And you know, I wish it for all of you. It's the greatest thing that ever occurred in my life. I came out of atheism to Christ. I was the hardest person you could ever talk to in the world about Christ. And I'm going to tell you, it's the real deal. If it wasn't a real deal, I wouldn't lie to you. I'm telling you, it, it dramatically changed my life. Dramatically. I'm talking about insight. Confidence. In well, will you go home tonight justified by, the God, by God's grace? Oh, I hope so. Oh, I hope so. If not tonight, before the night gets over, wake up the morning the new man in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. And boy, is that ever true. I'll tell you, somebody really knew it was sweet Claudia. Sweet Claudia really knew this. Sweet Claudia. And uh, so let's close in prayer. Let's go home. God milked the cow. When you milk the cow, you go home. There ain't no milk to get, so. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Listen, you can, you can settle this right now. You know, it's between you and the Lord. It's not between me and you. I've done mine. I mean, I, I brought the message. I'm just a messenger. Listen, you need to get this clear. For by grace are you saved through faith and not in yourself. It's a gift of God. What do I must believe? I must believe that Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. The gospel is the power of God to save you. The power is in the gospel. It's not in you. You don't save yourself. I don't save you. Christ came to save you. The gospel will save you when you believe it. What a wonderful thing that is. Have your destiny taken care of tonight. When you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what it means if you're saved. So our Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way to study with us the closing segment of the book of James. I want to thank you, Father for a wonderful plan that sent your only begotten son into the world through the Virgin Mary who kept himself impeccable. He who knew no sin became sin for me that I might become the righteousness of God in him. That's an unbelievable grace gift. I pray that upon every person here tonight that they might have the assurance that that's a settled deal in their soul. That the status of sinner can be changed to saint because of the grace of God. Well, thank you for Claudia with her stay with us and Tony has been wonderful. We are better for it. And what a wonderful family that we've got to know. Our people love them. And whatever needs to be settled, this whole trip was about settling it. This whole trip was to bring us to our senses. 
and let God rescue us and transfer us into the beloved kingdom of the Son. Oh, Father, we thank you tonight just for the possibilities, the prospects. The Holy Spirit could bring conviction to a point of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen.